Hello and welcome everyone. We're glad to have you here with us tonight. We're going to go ahead and get started and I think we'll probably have more folks continuing to join as we get going. Um, this is the New Directions in Public Garden speaker series featuring Sean Watts. Uh, my name is Jessica Farmer. I manage the adult education programs and communications for UW Botanic Gardens and I'm going to give you a few words of introduction here before we get started. Um, so, um, first off, as we get started, we want to take a moment to reflect on the land on which we live and work here in the Seattle area. Uh, we acknowledge and honor the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. We have um, to tonight uh, a few members of our speaker series. Um, the series is being hosted by the University of Washington Botanic Gardens. Our mission is sustaining managed and natural ecosystems and the human spirit through plant research, education, and display. Our gardens include the Washington Park Arboretum and the Center for Urban Horticulture in Seattle, Washington. That includes the Union Bay Natural Area, the Elizabeth C. Miller Library, and the UW Student Farm. We offer education and conservation programs that serve our entire region. This is the fifth and final session in our 2022 speaker series, New Directions in Public Gardens. This is a series of conversations exploring how gardens like ours can evolve to meet community needs both today and in the future. Um, tomorrow, after this last talk, we will be meeting for a co-creative town hall to work on creating plans for putting the ideas generated through this series into action. And we do still have a few seats left in the town hall. Um, that is tomorrow at the Washington Park Arboretum from 9 a.m. to noon. And I will put a link to the registration page in the chat here once I'm done with the introduction, if anybody's interested in signing up for that. Um, as far as the series and, and kind of how this came to be, uh, we see the colonial history of plant collections and the implicit and explicit exclusion of BIPOC communities from green spaces like public gardens as injustices that shape our past and present and must be countered as we move into the future. We're excited to dig into these conversations to learn more about community-led efforts in our region. Um, so. I'm going to go over a few words of introduction. We'll hear a presentation from our guest speaker about the work that they're involved with, and then we'll have a good amount of time for Q&A and discussion. So tonight we'll be hearing from Sean Watts of Sean M. Watts Consulting. Sean's work focuses on empowering communities to drive environmental and land use policy and helping historically white-led organizations move from awareness to action on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Sean is also a co-founder of the Community Land Conservancy, a people of color-led land conservancy that acquires land for parks in historically underserved communities. Sean will share with us about his work in both of those areas tonight, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion um, with Sean, uh, Maylin Plummer, who I'll introduce here in a minute, who's visiting us from Denver, and um, also UW Botanic Gardens Director, Christina Owen. I also want to express gratitude to our partners at the Arboretum Foundation for their support in the development of this series. All right, so um, for the audience members, uh, as we get going here, we will be keeping your microphones and cameras off and using the Zoom tools for discussion today. Um, I've enabled the auto transcription for closed captioning. You can click on the CC tool at the bottom of your screen to choose whether to show or hide those subtitles. You should see the Q&A and the chat tools at the bottom of your screen. We'll be using the, if you, as best you can remember, we'll be using the Q&A tool for questions for our speakers. And you can submit those questions at any time. We'll have ample time for addressing them at the end. You can also use that if you have any questions for me or need any technical assistance. And then we've got the chat open as a place for community conversation, kudos, and a place for you to record your thoughts. Um, we do ask that everyone keep it respectful in the chat and choose to use these conversations as an opportunity to move toward healing and creating action. We've got a few community agreements that we developed for this series. We are asking you to um, join us in finding comfort in discomfort. It's normal to feel discomfort while exploring racial and social inequity. 
while learning and discussion may not get any easier, your ability to engage in more meaningful conversations will expand. So we ask you to be courageous and courteous and stay engaged. The journey is worth the effort. Um, I want you to practice mindful listening and try to avoid planning what you're going to say as you listen to others. Just really listen with your whole self. And expect and accept non-closure. There's no quick fix. Uh, the more we discuss, the more we learn, the more we learn, the more appropriate and promising our actions and interventions will be. All right, um, so we are recording tonight's session. Tomorrow we'll send out an email with a link to the recording to everyone who registered to attend. We'll also be posting the recording to the speaker series website. And with that, I will turn the floor over to Maylin Plummer, uh, visiting us from the IDEA, IDEA Center for Public Gardens uh, to share a little bit more about the work happening at the center and what we're doing here with this series. Thank you so much, yeah. Jessica. It has been really such a joy, uh, a learning journey and just a pleasure to work with you and Christina and then getting a chance to meet these amazing and incredible thought leaders, uh, but also you know, people who are really putting um, action to words uh, and to their passion. <clears throat> and I just find that really um, not just inspiring, but it really, um, is very empowering. And I hope that others are, are really enjoying this process as well. So um, I'm excited to be here. I'm thrilled to be here in Seattle and that we have such a beautiful week of weather while I'm here. <laughs> it's just gorgeous. Uh, and that we'll be facilitating some really amazing, I think, thought um, exercises tomorrow. I think this is gonna be very, um, I think, empowering as well. But I think that the whole topic of kind of expanding our discomfort in areas, but yet being present and holding space for one another going through this process, I think is going to be really enlightening in a lot of ways. So I'm really excited and thrilled to be a part of this. So thank you again from the bottom of my heart, Christina and Jessica for this opportunity. So with that, uh, welcome everyone else and just excited uh, to be here. And uh, as the director of the IDEA Center for Public Gardens, IDEA, standing for Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Accessibility. I think uh, there's a lot going on in the world. And I say this every month, and it seems like even more seems to be going on. So I think part of um, what I like to do in these spaces is just kind of help you all settle in. Take a deep breath. I know it's been a busy day. There's uh, so much going on in the world. It's hard to keep track of everything. But you all showed up. And you all are here. And I think that that's a really beautiful thing. And that just speaks to um, your commitment uh, to this journey. So um, from myself and I think from the others, thank you for doing that. And thank you for being here. So uh, if you need to take a moment to take a big, huge, deep breath, do it. If you need to stretch, check in with your body, check in with your breathing. Like this is just a really time to, to just kind of be here and listen and observe and just kind of, this is part of that mindful practice, right? Um, getting a sense of where this discussion, discussion goes and where are we feeling that in our bodies? It's a really interesting thing. So I hope you will uh, indulge in that kind of process and maybe even jot some things down for your reflection later. So just kind of moor yourself in to this place and time and be here and just let everything else drift away and then just enjoy being here and only here for right now. In this work, we talk a lot about creating space for safety, conversation, and my favorite, possibilities. But in choosing to be here, I think we have also created a space of intention to be here and to continue onward as change agents. For that, we thank you and we celebrate you. One of the things that I like to do in large group settings and gatherings is to take a moment. And even though we can't see one another, we all know that there are others out here in this space with us. So just take a moment to be aware that there are many others here with us and know that we're here with good intentions. We have differences in why we are here. We are a mosaic of truths, experiences, circumstances, perspectives, opinions, abilities, identities, and ways of understanding. And we each belong to not just one group or identity, 
but many. One of the most wonderful things I heard recently was that identity was one of the most important choices that you could make in your life. So I believe this series creates a space of possibilities and opportunities, seeds that cultivate the world that we want to create, but I think they also help to inform us and in who we want to be. The intent of this series, which I think will resonate uh, with all of you, but this is also resonant with the Idea Center, um, and that number one, we are seeking impact. We want a greater number of people and organizations to prioritize and activate IDEA work and initiatives. We want enriched learning that deepens awareness, builds knowledge, and gives us language to form authentic connections and perhaps displace some assumptions and biases. As Jessica mentioned, comfort with discomfort. Uh, something that I, I really come to embrace and I really truly believe and I wanna start speaking more about is that um, let's think about discomfort in a different way. Let's think about discomfort as an invitation, not something to be avoided, but something that actually challenges you but also just invites you to step into a space that maybe you just aren't familiar with anymore and just explore, maybe thinking about something or seeing something just a little differently than you did before. And then that, that discomfort or that realm of comfort starts to expand bigger and bigger. So participants, we become more self-aware. We take steps to seek out the edges of our learning and comfort and that Ultimately, perhaps it shifts our discomforts into playful curiosity and something that might actually be celebrated and joyful. And lastly, connection. We are a community of shared experiences and stories that have the power to ripple far beyond our garden gates and that also activates intentions in ourselves, but in all the others, other people we know and our partnerships, our stakeholders, our visitors, and it can reach far beyond, right? And so this is what is, I think, really powerful about this work. So with that, let's begin. Welcome, Sean. I'm so excited for your presentation and I'm excited to let you begin. Okay, let me see if I can figure this out. I'm trying to do presenter okay. mode. <laughs> and while you're doing that, I'm going to just share, go ahead and share the link out to yeah. register for tomorrow if anybody still wants to join in on that. Okay. I'm here with you as you're getting set up. <laughs> Moral support. <laughs> right. Um, and if I can plug for tomorrow, um, one of the things that I love doing, and this is what I'm challenged with, is how to make being uncomfortable really fun. <laughs> so if that's enticing, <laughs> come on and join us. It's going to be a good time. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for for talking through the working agreements too. Uh, it was great because I didn't need to do them myself. Um, and thanks everyone for 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 joining us tonight and thanks for all the speakers you've had before it's a great it was a great series um some colleagues of mine and uh and i, I really appreciate that you've invested in kind of going across the whole the whole summer and um how you've pulled this all together so thanks for inviting me um so today i i wanted to combine uh, a couple talks that i give with apologies to um to the folks who've heard some of this before, but uh, um, you know, so I'll, I'll start out with the first half of the talk, um, uh, kind of presenting uh, the logic behind a belief that I have that environmentalism has a, a culture of self-sacrifice and what that means and uh, and the problem with that um, for environmentalism, as opposed to you know for people of color and for communities. Uh, that is an extension of it, but it's also at the core a challenge that that environmentalism and conservation face. Um, and then I'll kind of shift gears to uh, presenting on a project that uh, colleagues and I are trying to get off the ground that might help address some of those challenges to the, to environmentalism by putting local communities directly in the driver's seat of uh, land stewardship. Um, so then we should have plenty of time after that for for Q and A. Um, I've got, uh, you know, I'll be presenting kind of 27, 26 uh, slides, uh, but I have like 50 in this slide deck. So 
um, I can definitely uh, add to add to the uh, conversation as we move forward. So um, let me see. I think if it's it's important to kind of uh, you know as we spend this time together, I think it's it's helpful to keep uh, several uh, quotes in in mind. In particular, this one in the, at the top. I think you know when you're accustomed to privilege, equality or equity feels like oppression. Um, you know, I urge you to 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 uh, if you start to feel defensive, um, at, like and like you're being attacked. If if you're a, a white person, just kind of try to see through the red and 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 really kind of consider my point because I am not actually demonizing any single group, but talking about the facts as they are um, and, and what is versus ought um, to be. And then the second one I, I love uh, from Muna Abdi, um, it is not inclusion to invite people into a space you're unwilling to change. Uh, I, I hope you're all here because you want to see that change, but recognize that that change may go in directions that you did not anticipate, um, but that is what is necessary if you want to truly be inclusive you can't be, you know, what got us here is not going to be what gets us uh, further along. So with that, I'll uh, launch into this piece about environmentalism and the culture of self-sacrifice. Um, so I've been, a, uh, you know, wanted to be a conservation biologist and ecologist for longer than I, I knew the term for it. Um, but I grew up poor in the D.C. area. Um, and it wasn't until long after my undergrad degree that I, I realized that you, you don't have to be absolutely miserable uh, to work in the field, um, to be just soaked with rain through to the bone, foot rot from bad shoes. Um, you know, I, I remember running trap lines looking for small mammals in the forests of, of Appalachia in jeans and, and $20 boots. And I just figured at the time that was the price you had to pay for a career in conservation. And think about how many, I mean, I, I must be a, a masochist because think about how many people um, just came to that same conclusion and decided to do something else. Not to mention the fact that it's not like you're suffering for that and then getting a huge payout in the form of, uh, of you know, becoming a medical doctor or lawyer. Um, and, and so this is kind of what has fueled my perception that, that uh, environmentalism and, and conservation have this culture of self-sacrifice and that it's infused throughout the modern environmental movement um, in ways that are not just exclusionary, but hamper the progress toward the very goals of biodiversity conservation that, that, that we all espouse. Um, the goals that we are trying to achieve are being hampered by the, the lack of diversity um, and, and of perspective and lived experience uh, in, in the sector. Um, and so this goes all the way back to the roots of the modern environmental movement and conservation. Um, you know, so we have Thoreau preaching simple living in nature, um, Muir, Nature Reveals God. Teddy Roosevelt was focused on maximum yield for, for generations of men and trees. Um, Pinchot, uh, Gifford Pinchot espoused the conservation ethic. Uh, so as opposed to the preservationist, uh, the conservation ethic, and then Aldo Leopold, the land ethic, and, and many more, including Madison Grant, uh, a, you know, a, a, an avowed racist. Um, and, you know, these are the the, the core uh, you know, leaders that spawn the, the environmental movement. Um, and whether or not, and all of this was, was about protection of nature, either conservationist or preservationist, but protecting nature from humans, which also has an automatic kind of exclusivity that comes with that perception of protecting nature, um, you know, protection of nature for chiefly, uh, especially early on, elite recreation. Um, Muir was not trying to save the Sierra and and uh, Tuolumne and and Valley and and Yosemite Valley um, uh, from from development and from from logging um for the brown people of of the nation i mean he was an avowed racist as well i mean he, he had the, his he was incredibly disparaging of the miwok indians who who lived uh there for uh since time immemorial um and that exclusivity remains deeply embedded in the modern environmental movement like it or not um you know and when we look at the the folks you know 
Teddy Roosevelt, patriarchal and and uh, and and his interest in manifest destiny. And I like to remember Eleanor more um, for what she did. Pinchot was a eugenicist. Um, Aldo Leopold, uh, despite um, you know writing beautifully, uh, was anti-immigrant. Was afraid that immigrants would overrun the country. Thoreau was anti-slavery, um, but of course he was also in the 1800s and 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 had uh, other instances where he was kind of um, along with the culture of his time. So the entirety of the United States is a historically white-led organization. Um, and this is what I kind of am getting at by the deeply embedded culture of self-sacrifice, this idea that we should be giving up of ourselves to protect nature from, uh, from, from destruction. But I think the end result of that in this day and age has become a, uh, a framing and messaging and opportunities um, that that have this culture. And so, for example, you know, when you go to, uh, to school as an undergrad, the opportunities that open the doors for you, that, that um, grant you access to, to mentors who, who will, will guide you through and to your, your future career as an ecologist, um, cost money. They cost a lot of money. Um, internships abroad, uh, study abroad, um, even if you're getting your room and board paid for, you still have to pay for airfare to get to, to these places. And not just that, um, you are as a, uh, especially, you know, for me, I, I, I work my summer. I, the opportunity costs of not working the summer to get my the money for books or, or, or anything else in the, in the uh, school year was just made it a, a non uh, option uh, for me. When we look at the framing and messaging, save the turtles, save the whales, eat the Japanese. And as a half Japanese person, I take that personally. Um, and save the elephants, call a po poacher without considering why are, you know, what is driving the poaching in the first place? Should we save the dolphins or, or polar bears? Um, and where in that calculus uh, is, is my child who I'm worried about feeding this month? Um, eat organic, stop driving. Who has to drive? The people who can't afford to live in cities close to transit. Um, organic food may be, may be expensive, but it's worth it. That is not an equitable pitch. Um, you know, I, I, I like the fact that in this, they, they can't bring themselves to say that the benefits simply outweigh the cost, but they have to tag on for many because it's even clear to them that no, organic food does, uh, being expensive, be, it, it, it does not outweigh the benefit um, if you are too poor to afford uh, food uh, in general. So you contrast that with the history and core motiv motivations of the environmental justice movement. Um, these were deeply seated in, uh, in, the, in, in protecting community from the environmental degradation caused to these communities because of environmental racism. Um, in 1982, the, the, the issue that really sparked the entire movement was these 6,000 truckloads of toxic soil that were gonna be dumped in a predominantly black community in North Carolina. Um, six weeks of protests, five, 523 arrests, and North Carolina dumped it anyway. But uh, it formally sparked the EJ movement and forced the government accountability office's hands and, um, and they did a study where they found three out of four uh, toxic landfills in the South were cited next to low-income communities of color. And so that at least put it on the federal government's map, this issue of environmental racism. And think about the leaders. They emerge out of the civil rights movement. There was an environmental um, uh, you know, movement in the civil rights movement and the first Earth Day featured a lot of discussion about uh, environmental justice. And these were faith-based faith communitarian civil rights leaders who were counseling civil disobedience, disobedience and policy advocacy to affect policy and culture change. Um, and the strength of their message was in that moral imperative of the fact that it is, it is unethical, it is, it is just criminal to be dumping this toxic waste um, in open pits next to, next to communities of color, as opposed to this convoluted logic around protecting nature from people um, when in fact we need nature more than it needs us, which is a really important thing to, to remember. Nature's gonna be fine. It will, even if we blow ourselves up, it's going to be fine. Um, and so 
this is what I refer to as the original sin of the environmental movement, that it's couched in this ethos of, of protecting nature from people. And you contrast that with environmental justice being couched in this, in this you know, framed up by protecting people from human degraded nature. Um, and this set these two movements early on in the 80s or late in the 70s on two fundamentally different trajectories. In the early 90s, the environmental justice leaders brought uh, themselves together and wrote a, um, a, uh, an open letter to the, the, the bingos, as I call them, the big NGOs, um, the Southwest Organizing Project accused these big NGOs of exclusionary policies, complacency with regard to environmental racism. Um, and this is 1990. Uh, and some of the, the, you know, the logos of, of those uh, organizations who received this letter uh, 32 years ago now um, are in the background there. In 1991, the following year, the uh, Environmental Leadership Summit, the first POC Environmental Leadership Summit was pulled together which established the principles of environmental justice and a call to action for healthy, livable communities. Um, and, you know, just to put a fine point on it, the, the, the issue here is that in the environment, a healthy environment is not just a nice to have. It's not uh, simply uh, for elite recreation. It is, it is a fundamental right, if health is a right um, in this country, which I guess is, is debatable, unfortunately. But nature directly improves health outcomes, birth outcomes, childhood development, performance at school, social cohesion, mental health, um, immune function. function um, uh, simply having a tree outside of your window uh, when you are in post-op um, uh, in speeds your recovery. Uh, it reduces uh, all of these these health uh, you know um, uh, uh, health issues of obesity, asthma, diabetes, blood pressure, rates of heart disease reduce criminality, uh, stress, anxiety, depression, these cumulative uh, impacts of, of uh, these stressors, the, the, the constantly constant vigilance, the high cortisols uh, levels in, in people, they, they kill them earlier. As Paulina pointed out in an earlier talk, um, you have a 13 year difference between some of the better off neighborhoods in Seattle and South Park and Georgetown um, in, in the lifespan of individuals there. But despite the fact that this, these tremendous health benefits exist of access to nature, it is not as straightforward to accomplish um, that access as it should be. Um, not just because of the policy or funding issues, but also many communities are deeply divided over the need for parks and green space versus a prospect of green gentrification, which we'll come back to. Um, and because of those fears, and, and like I said, a, a number of other factors, and including the public sector policies that allow for development versus um, requirements for, for adequate open space. Um, these, these, uh, this issue remains. And, um, and the residents of these communities that, that need this access the most have multiple competing priorities, housing, education, public safety, um, uh, you know, crime. Healthy green communities are just often pushed further down the list, despite how uh, access to nature underpins a lot of those priority issues. Um, just to look at one, one spot, um, this is Gateway Park North, uh, you know, and here we are 30 years after that, that letter to, uh, to the bingos and we've had way too little progress in environmental justice. We still have issues like this. I don't even know if you know where Gateway Park North is. It's, it's right next to, to um, it's on the shores of the Duwamish River, right um, uh, uh, between or to the west of, of Georgetown. Um, you know, and and this is the the this neighborhood's only uh, residential river access. The only way that they can go down to the river, um, and this is uh, a a boat ramp on on that river uh, that that uh, in the top right um, of the of the slide, and you know this this is. This is absolutely ridiculous to call this a park. Um, and this is actually the rubble strewn beach be boat ramp that people want to uh, still want to access just to, to go down next to the river, but they have to walk two and a half blocks past an equipment rental, 
an iron scrap place that's been fined constantly over the years for, for dumping into the river and for particulates in the air, a trucking warehouse where trucks, semis go in and out all day long, seven days a week, uh, waste management uh, facility that, that distributes their, where the, the trucks taking your garbage out uh, to the dump um, are, are housed. Um, the CDL recycling, which is uh, finally no longer there, but they used to do a, an open air demolition, like an industrial demolition there. Marking Machinery is actually a great <laughs> spot. Uh, they, they've done a lot for the neighborhood, um, but still an, another in, industrial uh, factory. Um, and then the reload facility on the bottom left there, that is where when they have dredged spoil, uh, the toxic spoil full of heavy metals um, and all sorts of toxins out of the Duwamish River Superfund site, they are loaded onto, um, onto uh, rail cars and taken out of, out of town. So inevitably there is tons of toxic, um, plumes of toxins that are just coming up off, out, out of these businesses and blowing the short block or so across um, uh, marginal way directly into the neighborhood of Georgetown. If this is the unacceptable reality that many of our, our neighborhoods face, you know, why is, why is, how does that happen? And we have to look at the, the challenge of advocating um, if, if you are in a lower income neighborhood, a 90 minute public meeting is so much more of a sacrifice in neighborhoods like this than they are in well-off neighborhoods where you have a wealth of human capital. You have retirees who are, who are then retiring from, from jobs where they, they likely got the expertise for policy advocacy or coordination or co coalition building or fundraising. You have single family incomes that are, that are supporting childcare, senior care, um, transportation to that public meeting. Um, might require several transfers on, on a bus line to get downtown and several hours uh, uh, in, in, in commute time. In this case in Gateway Park, the residents there were so convinced that the city and county would never do anything about it, that they were reluctant to put their blood and treasure and, and time into pursuing these improvements because they'd been, their hopes had been dashed so many times for decades. Um, and they're well aware uh, uh, that, you know, once the river and these green spaces are actually improved, that they, they risk uh, displacement. And so this kind of situation, I call the inverse tragedy of the commons, where as opposed to the traditional tragedy of the commons, where an individual um, or an individual uh, uh, business might reap all of the benefits while everyone shares in the negatives, right? Where the, the pollution that they spew up in the air is shared by everyone in the, in, 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 in the area. Um, in this case, if this is improved for the benefit of the world um, and the broader uh, city and region, um, the negatives of, of potentially losing access, their only access to the river because they've closed it off and restored this area, all of those negatives are borne by the neighborhood um, and, and the, you know, the displacement that might come along with that. So this is this false choice, I believe, between the kind of affordability of this neighborhood and the livability that you don't want to have because it's likely that your rents are gonna go up and you're gonna be displaced. So this is this kind of Faustian bargain that they have with, uh, with, with, with parks like this. And so this you know, didn't just happen overnight. Um, it, took, it goes back uh, a 400 or so years. Um, and there was a study uh, in 2016 that looked at um, this history of, of, of slavery and racism in Jim Crow South and found that it would take um, 228 years for black families to amass the same amount of wealth uh, that white families have today. And so we have uh, you know, 200, almost 250 years of slavery, of chattel slavery, and that was then followed by 100 years of Jim Crow South. And then we have the civil rights movement in the 1960s um, uh, and, but we're still not there. And why is that? Because the Jim Crow period, I see as a period like a, a crucible where uh, um, the policies were developed to hold people, uh, you know, that, that flew kind of under the bar of legal discrimination as it was laid out then, um, but maintained a white supremacy culture. Um, 
And so that's where we established these, these policies, and importantly, not just the policies, but the norms and practices, the institutional norms and pra practices that perpetuate oppression just below that legal threshold, unequal access to educational and business opportunities and tax benefits, employment discrimination, racial bias in the criminal justice system, the criminal justice system being created to transfer slave labor into um, prison labor, um, home ownership, importantly, which remains the one, one of the most significant contributors to wealth generation. Um, at that time, you have discriminatory housing practices, the impossibility of getting capital for down payments. Even when people of color own homes, they have been shown to, to the present day, suffer disproportionately from collapsing housing markets. Every time there's a crisis, communities of color go into them worse and they come out worse off. And those disparities continue to expand. Um, so after the Jim Crow South period, this kind of, uh, you know, the insidious norms and practices just kind of moved into boardrooms and in, in the kind of institutional norms and practices, which I, in my um, work at the Seattle Parks Foundation, I would run up against. And I remember, you know, asking to do certain things um, and, and advocating for certain things in communities and having staff at agencies say, well, you know, we can't do that. And I would, I would push the point and say, well, where's the policy that says we can't? And they couldn't find it. And then they would find out and they would uncover the fact that it's just a norm in practice. There's no policy anywhere. The policy is incredibly vague and flexible, but it's just not been done. Um, and that is, is continuing. That's the, that's the, those are the norms and practices that kind of, um, you know, just, just perpetuate the status quo. Um, and it's gonna require the empowerment of communities of color with an intimate understanding of the barriers that they face in order to turn that around. So that is why my, my proposal for, uh, for addressing this culture of self-sacrifice and shifting that to something that is much more communitarian um, and community driven uh, is to flip this environmental nar environmentalist narrative from educating communities, which is such a common still even today uh, trope of, in, of environmental organizations, to educate communities on, on just if they understood the benefits of nature, um, that they would, they would do more to protect nature. Um, and, and that then, you know, if we, can, if we can do that, then maybe we can fit community needs into that environmental work. We need to flip that completely on its head um, to training policymakers and researchers and practitioners in conservation and environment about the benefits to nature of addressing the needs of people. If we are figuring out the bottom line that allows someone who is a, in a lower income and faces an uphill battle in terms of discrimination in their daily lives, if we are able to address the bottom line and allow them the opportunity to choose um, environmental uh, practices versus ones that would degrade the environment because they are at no difference in cost or better yet, actually cost less, then we'll get a lot further. And we have not traditionally in the environmental um, uh, policy uh, field needed to hit that bottom line. We have not tested the policies that we propose under that harsh lens, you know, through that harsh lens and that filter of will people be able to afford the choice that we want them to, to adopt? Um, so this is gonna require um, historically white-led organizations like I said, that includes government. Government is a historically white-led institution to listen, to learn, and to develop new muscles to change the way that they uh, that they that they the, the standard kind of run of business. Um, and so that brings me to the second half of the of the talk. Um, and this one is then focused more on the establishment of the um, of the community land conservancy, which is. Uh, kind of half of, of, uh, of a strategy that I, I see um, as addressing some of this, uh, this need to flip the environmentalist uh, narrative. So um, this is just, uh, if, you, if you go to the, if you search Community Land Conservancy or go to communitylandconservancy.org, uh, um, we have a case for support there that you can download. Uh, if you go down and click this image on the, uh, on the website, you can uh, read a bit more about it. Uh, I wanna start out 
by thanking my um, fellow, uh, you know, uh, the advisory committee members, Paulina Lopez, Naisha Fort Brooks, Brad Brickman, uh, and Lily Ayala, um, who have been uh, through thick and thin helping to kind of craft uh, this, this idea. Um, and definitely want to acknowledge all of the, the folks who I've talked with, community organizers, social justice le leaders, nonprofit and public agency staff who've helped me refine this idea. Um, and uh, you know, none of this would have been possible without um, uh, funding from the Seattle Foundation, Satterberg, uh, the Cuyamaca Foundation and personal investments from many others. And, um, and thanks to my former employer and fiscal sponsor, uh, the Seattle Parks Foundation, who does a lot more than just simply um, running our books, but helps uh, quite a bit, it helps a lot of parks uh, and, and, um, and community garden organizations and groups uh, uh, get their projects off the ground. So shifting gears, um, if we, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone on this, this uh, webinar um, recognizes how little nature uh, communities of color have access to, um, and, and hopefully that's why you're here. Um, and also the disproportionate impacts of environmental degradation uh, that those communities face. Um, and in this image, uh, this map shows, uh, you know, the darker blue, the, the census tract, um, the higher the proportion of people of color and low in, lower income uh, folks and uh, English proficiency. And then if you look closely, each of those census tracts has a dot and the warmer the dot, the lower the vegetation, um, the, the canopy cover. Um, and so you can just see by the distribution of those dots. And if you are familiar with the uh, income areas, you know, up near the gardens in UW, you have a lot cooler dots in Laurelhurst and Wedgwood um, and, uh, and in Northeast. Um, and if you go down into the Duwamish Valley, for example, where we were looking, you get a lot warmer dots. And so, you know, this, it should not be that income and race determine your access to nature. Your zip code should not determine whether or not you have access to nature. We need affordable and livable green neighborhoods. And this is just um, Seattle. If we, uh, if we look to a similar map in, in the broader kind of Western King County, um, the same patterns uh, occur. So the, the kind of purpley pink um, uh, areas are indicating areas that have lower health inequities, lower income areas, and limited open space access. And those correspond to neighborhoods uh, that are, are lower income, right? So we risk repeating the pattern as we um, force folks to move out of neighborhoods that they grew up in in Seattle because we are just marching towards a one-class city. They are being displaced to neighborhoods where this pattern is being repeated. And so we have to get ahead of the game in preventing the, this, 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 um, you know, this history from repeating itself or rhyming as, as Samuel Clemens said. So as we discussed before, nature access is not simply a luxury or nice to have, and that you know, this has these you know, deep racial disparities in access to the benefits didn't just appear overnight, they're the result of these in intentional policies and norms and practices to perpetuate white supremacy culture in this country. Um, and, you know, so now I just want to shift to what we hope to do about it through the Community Land Conservancy. Um, and, you know, and first let me focus in on why. Um, you know, this is a crucial, this is a watershed moment in, um, in, in so many ways, in terms of a racial reckoning, um, in terms of, of the, the ever increasing abundance of evidence for rapid and, and rapidly increasing rates of climate change. You know, the, they keep revising these, the pace of climate change and, um, and the, the, the greater uh, adoption of green infrastructure. So, so, you know, now while we are, are debating the costs and benefits of replacing gray infrastructure with green and resilient infrastructure, we need expert POC voices in the conservation space. While we are planning and implementing climate adaptation and mitigation strategies with fires and floods happening more and more frequently and for longer periods of the year, 
while we are recovering from COVID and the um, you know, and COVID has shined a, a spotlight on the economic inequality of, of just who we consider essential workers. Um, you know, so this historic and systemic racial discrimination has a spotlight on, on it. If we're going to harness this fierce urgency of now in conservation and the environment, then we need to get our shit together because it's, we're running out of time because the folks who have the lived experience you know, both the lived experience of the barriers that they face and, the, uh, and, and then the, the need for technical and policy expertise paired together with that lived experience um, is what's necessary to navigate an environmental sector that is still tightly white, bound to white and wealthy culture. Um, without their voices in this conversation, it is my belief that we are not going to come up with strategies that actually address these issues. Um, and that shouldn't come across as hostility, but as simple fact. If you just think about the cultural, uh, uh, you know, the culture of the institutions that work on environmental and land use policy, regulatory and fiscal policy, real estate development, landscape architecture and design, fundraising and philanthropy, these are predominantly white fields and sectors. And these are then the fields that are the gateways for conservation and environmental projects, and therefore the gatekeepers, well-meaning uh, or otherwise, for this kind of work are still, to this day, 30 years after these calls for change, mostly white. So a solution to that in our, in our belief is to create a POC-led land conservancy, because we need a voice amplifier for communities in those spaces, in those rooms where currently decisions are being made about instead of with us. Um, an organization like this could acquire and own and design open space to serve the needs of our own neighborhoods, um, advocate for policies that ensure community driven uh, and publicly accessible open space, uh, provide technical advice and support and partner with community groups on land use issues and it could increase that the 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 gap in human and social capital um, of institutionally underserved communities in development planning. The the need to be able to be in those spaces to have the time to keep hammering on uh, that agency staff person who's like, well, no, we just don't do that, and to keep coming back and saying, but why? But why? That takes an immense amount of persistence and persistence that I've only seen successfully, uh, or not only, actually, let me completely take that back, but too common, I only see that kind of success associated with folks who are, you know, wealthy white male uh, and retired and with a lot of time on their hands and know just enough about a system to keep pushing on the button until they finally get what they need. So an organization that has three kind of simultaneous factors, I think is what we need. So is able to address these kind of technical needs, but more importantly, has these kinds of attributes. Um, you know, they need the, the expertise uh, and accreditation and the clout to, to, to navigate um, land use, the, the complexity uh, and power dynamics in land use and the legal accreditation to acquire and hold that land. Um, and, you know, we want to create an organization that, that remains small and nib nimble, but would then negotiate and subcontract for technical capacity support from public and private and nonprofit partners who uh, we would then vet for their commitment to, um, to equity. But either way, um, would not have the, would not be prime on a project. Um, and then finally, and but most importantly, um, by being of, by, and for uh, uh, communities of color, through the lived experience of the staff themselves, the leadership of the organization, um, they would have a, an innate and deep understanding of, and, and sensitivity to the barriers that, that people of color face when navigating the systems and would have a head start on the, on the prerequisite of trust building that is required to work uh, closely with and in, in communities. Um, you know, like it or not, well-intentioned or not, people of color have been burned too many times, 
even by well-meaning um, uh, white folks who just don't understand uh, a lot of the, 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 the cultural differences in these communities. And so, so we need an organization that can kind of step into that breach and act as a policy liaison and a hub and, a, uh, and, and seek out the technical um, uh, capacity support uh, to, to navigate these systems. So what this looks like, and then I'll, I'll wrap up um, and, and be happy to, to move into question and answer. Um, uh, you know, this is, as you can see, a very bare bones schematic, but the idea would be, um, you know, this lean organization, fairly small, not, not trying to kind of vertically integrate and become like the Nature Conservancy, you know, like an international global organization with hundreds and hundreds of employees, but a relatively small staff that accesses a network of historically white led organizations. Um, that small staff is tightly linked to communities of color um, and, uh, and, and, and is working with them closely, but has access to um, and has, can filter select organizations that are truly committed. And there are a few, and I, I work with a few in my, my consulting work um, that are stepping up to do this kind of work. Um, and those organizations would be subcontracted on projects by the CLC who would act as prime and legally be able to receive funding for this kind of work um, and hold land um, and would then subcontract to these organizations who can offer their expertise um, and uh, either on a pro bono or uh, an in-kind basis or at least on a kind of subsidized rate, you know, lower rates um, in, in these projects for their hard costs, for example. And that ensures just the mere fact that those organizations would be acting as subcontractors instead of prime on a project would ensure that the community through the CLC and with the CLC would be staying in the, in the driver's seat. Um, the CLC would then be providing oversight over the work that those organizations are doing and only the work that, that is being requested of them. Um, I mean, too many times, like I said, I've seen well-meaning organizations that, that really do want to work closely with communities of color, but they, they just steamroll the community and they have such a, um, a, a preconceived notion of what nature looks like, of what a garden looks like, of what a park should look like and, and, the, um, and the outcomes that they want to see that they end up steamrolling the community who doesn't have the time to keep kind of hammering on them about their needs and like keeping them on the path. Um, and so similarly, the CLC could act as a broker um, and, and a, a, an agent for the community in public agencies and in, in kind of navigating the policy, as well as um, uh, 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 seeking funding, public or private, uh, in, in, in these projects. And so we also see these, um, the organization working differently in different kind of developed areas. So you have um, in urban and suburban areas, working closely with community land trusts and, and, and housing developers who are focused on affordable housing so that um, you know, green space is factored into the design from early on, as opposed to being a bolt-on or some requirement that the developer has neither the expertise nor the, the, the money because their margins are so tight to really develop in, in, the, in the way or to fundraise for, for, for better um, uh, open space. Um, working with green jobs and advocacy organizations uh, to, to access, um, to, to kind of build uh, stewardship organizations in those neighborhoods where there is green space so that the, the county or city, instead of paying, uh, instead of paying their, uh, uh, you know, paying to cover the stewardship and being spread thin across an entire county, maybe the funding can go to community groups to be actually stewarding their own local nature and open space. Um, and community and friends of groups that that get up, uh, you know, that that navigate the the design process and um, and the the advocacy for for new and different kinds of open space. Whereas in rural areas, we could see working with private farmers and landowners to acquire properties and to hold those for farming collectives to work closely with, uh, I saw you also had Susan Balbus who um, uh, with the Na'ilihi Fund 
has just finally they got enough money together to launch uh, Elliptilicum, um, which is an indigenous focused land conservancy um, and partnering with groups like that to to, sh to share opportunities and to acquire and uh, um, and turn over land to indigenous groups. Um, and then wilderness access organizations, you know, uh, the Wilderness Society in King County and others worked closely to to set up Trailhead Direct. So these are opportunities um, that the Community Land Conservancy could partner with to increase access in these rural areas to or uh, to opportunities like that to access um, uh, green space and to and for greater transit to to these areas. Um, but you know, one thing I really want to make clear is that we are intentionally not baking this idea. We are intentionally not zeroing in on a single value proposition um, because we want to make sure that this organization becomes, uh, you know, develops the, the tools that are going to have the greatest benefit and the greatest impact for communities of color in this space. But what we do no, is currently our value proposition, you know, right now is simply to establish a, a framework for community collective power um, that can push into a traditionally white dominated land use and conservation space so that uh, in communities of color where there is this lack of access, it's the community that is driving and benefiting from the, um, the, the economic benefits of doing work on, on these natural areas and the outcomes themselves. Um, so in the future, what that role looks like specifically um, is to, de to be determined by our community partners. Um, we're just hoping to kind of midwife this idea into being, and um, you know, this is just the beginning, and, and we are working on a couple different pilot projects. Um, we're working closely with the Skyway Coalition uh, in, uh, in, in Skyway on, on an, uh, a, a huge opportunity uh, with Homestead Land, uh, Community Land Trust where the Brooks Village um, site has been acquired by Homestead Community Land Trust and has a, a large natural area and wetland area that we're hoping to help um, uh, develop a community stewardship organization around that site and its restoration and maintenance so that they are being funded for that work and creating uh, urban farming and uh, horticulture in and around this future uh, development in, these, uh, in this natural area that surrounds it. That's this kind of future of hyper-local stewardship that I am interested in. And, I, and, and in that, I see the future of uh, a, a sustainable environmental movement. And I mean sustainable in that case in terms of the, its capacity to keep co going. We're not going to manage all of the uh, of, res of the restoration and conservation work that is needs to be done um, in a top-down way. It really needs to be bottom up and, and hyper local, and that's uh, what I what I hope we can help foster through uh, the CLC and other organizations I'm I'm working with. So I'll leave you with um, one more quote uh, from Andre Perry at the Brookings Institution: "Investing in place and not people encourages gentrification." And that is exactly what our society has been doing. It's been investing in the place and attracting the people who can afford that place. We're hoping to upend that approach by focusing on people and communities and building their capacity for self-determination in the frontline communities that are suffering the most from climate change impacts and environmental degradation. Society is broken when, you know, an individual's access to nature benefits is determined by their ethnicity and socioeconomic status. And that's what we're trying to, to resolve. Um, and resolving that issue is the step, the, the kind of, like I said, this prerequisite step toward addressing these broader existential threats that we're going to be facing more and more frequently in the future, famine, pollution, fire, climate change, uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, and, and so that I'll, I'll leave you with, with just one other case study, or I'll point to a study that was done in, in 2019 that showed you know, 92% of historically redlined cities in the in North America uh, now have a worse urban heat island effect than than their neighbors who did not have redlining, and that is, of course, you can imagine why, right? These concrete jungles that were established in bad neighborhoods that were designated bad neighborhoods by by through redlining, and um, and then now have are uh, have so much concrete. Um, and so few trees that they are uh, these 
heat sponges. And so that's where we see the nexus between climate change and justice, because if we truly address those historic wrongs in terms of redlining and affordable housing, um, but we don't simultaneously um, uh, work on, well, redlining and affordable housing and um, the lack of street trees and, and lack of access to, to green space. But if we don't address that without actually allowing people to be able to afford to stay there, then we're just you know, uh, adding insult to injury and pushing folks out and, and, ex and, and adding to this historic um, uh, you know, uh, inequities. And we need to empower people of color to help drive that work so that they, they who understand what they need are able to be in the spaces where people can, can help them get what they need. Um, so that's, that's my hope and um, I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions. I'm gonna, gonna leave this, this um, presentation up uh, because I'm sure we'll, we might dive into a few more of these, these slides further on, but thank you so much for your attention. Um, and sticking with me through that, uh, through through me talking at you. So, with that I'll hand it back to you, Jessica. Great. Oh, it's gotten so dark here. Let's see if my... <laughs> <laughs> I will turn on more lights in a minute. But thank you so much, Sean. Um, really powerful presentation, and and so great for us to hear about um, both kind of the context of how we got to where we are and um, the work that you and your colleagues are doing to address that. Um, so thank you. And mm -hmm. I would now like to invite uh, Maylin back and Christina Owen, who is the director of UW Botanic Gardens, to join us for some conversation. Um, folks in the audience, we, we'd invite you to put questions in the Q&A uh, specifically for Sean and what he's talked about. Um, and also, you know, we can we can learn more about these projects and we can take this conversation in the direction of you know where do we go from here how do we how do we create change and so happy to talk about things there Mayla and Christina do either of you have something you'd like to kick us off with as we wait for the audience to weigh in I always have something to say but I, I want to give Christina that opportunity <laughs> as well <laughs> Well, you know, actually, Maylin, I was thinking about our earlier conversation today and about the connection between, and I think, Sean, you put it so beautifully, the, the connection between people and the environment and this idea that, that human beings are somehow divorced from or should be divorced from nature. And so when we think about public land put into trust, for example, like national parks and things and the way that those have traditionally been managed, divorced from the people and the impact that that's had and what the data shows about how unhealthy those forests actually are and how prone they are to fires and things. I think it it's there's something I think very important about that connection between people and nature. And it's not just this kind of warm fuzzy feeling of that you get when you're in nature, but it's something deeper than that, not just for us and the benefits we get, but for the, the nature itself. And I just thought that you painted such a beautiful picture of how important it is to maintain that connection in this environmental justice work and that centering on that relationship um, has so many benefits, not just for people, but for nature as well. Right, yeah, thanks for that. I, it's, I mean, in, in my life, I, I lived in, you know, moved five times between ages 10 and 18. And I can remember uh, in one of the moves, like kind of the, the third move, um, just seeing a development starting and seeing that they were uh, fixing up the the playground, which had always been a wreck, you know, like I'd always get pinched by the chains on the, the swing. And I remember thinking, I'm what, I don't know, 10, 11 years old. I remember thinking like, oh, wow, I guess we're going to move <laughs> and soon. Like, seriously, I had already made that connection that like, oh, they're improving the neighborhood. Then I guess we're going to be moving on. Um, and sure enough, we, we did uh, about a year later um, move again. And that's kind of, that shouldn't be the realization of a 10-year-old. <laughs> and, and then on the flip side, 
you know, really, uh, I, I, the, the hangover of this kind of protecting nature trope, um, the, the, you know, mother nature as this wilting lily, like she is fierce. Like, what are you talking about? Like, why, how did we get in the situation where, where that was our, that was the winning strategy to win people over instead of we, like I, I always say, we, we have all of the arguments. We just fail to make them. We fail to make them because people, conservation, I mean, as a conservation biologist, there was a long time that it was, um, there was this huge debate over the valuation of ecosystem services because the fear was um, that if we start putting a value on, on the regulation of, of water, the, 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 the benefits that nature provides and cleaning our, our air and water and, and food and all of that, once you put a, a price on it, then we're gonna get outbid by, um, you know, for spaces, then people, and, and I see the logic there, but I, I don't see why there's a debate over whether or not you can, or you, where you, whether or not you should, because we have to start actually really hammering, uh, drilling down into how much value is provided by nature in order to get anywhere near the, the debate. So it looks like we have some questions. Yeah, yeah, um, I wanna start with this question from Andrew. Uh, in a city like Seattle, where historically redlined neighborhoods and communities of color have been focused on for improvement projects, um, how do we authentically engage in a way that empowers community and avoids engagement fatigue? Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Um, and this was, this is a perfect segue to the slides that Jessica was like, oh, can you put those other slides up in there? And I was like, I'm going to be talking at them for too long. <laughs> so um, we'll kind of shift to that. Thanks for that question. And uh, well, I'll point out this slide is just um, my, my term for, uh, for, for organizations that are diverse in name only that have invested in learning the kind of language of, of, of diversity, equity, inclusion, but not um, the actual uh, work. I call them dinos. Um, and you know what, you, what we need to be, be thinking about in kind of upending, you know, what what's behind that that glib statement of flipping the environmentalist name uh, um, uh, narrative is is that is this kind of a strategy, this iterative process of building trust first in a community long before there is a project or an opportunity. How many times has an organization that you've been involved in that wants to do this work um, been like, oh, here's a grant uh, opportunity um, that is focused on some benefit to a community, and they, uh, you know, uh, they they craft the whole strategy, and then they go out to a community and say, hey, here's this opportunity. We'd like to, you know, and look at what a great opportunity is for you, um, and uh, you know, you're the subject of this thing, and then it's due next week. So we'd like you to review this grant proposal and sign a you know, letter of support and all this and get involved right in the last minute when the, you know, it's like, it's like showing up to a party with a, with, with a birthday cake and saying like, oh, what kind of cake do you want? It's like, well, the cake is already baked and where were you, you know, uh, way before in, in this process. And so what underpins this kind of iterative process for me is that um, and gets away from that engagement fatigue is building long-term uh, relationships with communities so that those that trust is already in place when an opportunity arises. That necessarily um, takes more work, and it's part of the reason why um, uh, you know I've I've focused on the uh, in that that CLC structure. There are nonprofit organizations are partners. Um, on one side, because uh, agencies tend not to have the staff capacity to attend every community meeting that they need to and be out there, but they can do some of that work. But nonprofits often, that is their focus, is to be out in community. And um, if we um, build, I, I like to say, you know, show up before you're on the agenda. So don't show up when you have an idea that you're trying to sell. Um, which is what leads to this kind of engagement fatigue is like, oh, here's another person to come in and present us with a, a super awesome idea um, and, and, and tell us what we need to do to get to take advantage of it. And it's going to be next week. Um, instead, just show up before you're on the agenda, learn what the community's issues are. And importantly, don't just pay attention to the issues that 
are so obviously linked to your mission, but li listen to all of the issues and then kind of retroactively um, uh, fit what your value proposition is as an organization or an individual. What is it that you have expertise to offer that can actually help address some of the needs that come up? So fit your um, expertise to those needs <clears throat> instead of coming in and saying, here's my expertise and here's an idea and um, trying to sell it that way. First figure out what are the, what are the communities need and do that long before there's an opportunity. Um, and this is the same in, in particular in kind of policy advocacy. Too often um, there is a, uh, you know, a, a bill or, or, you know, some legislative part of the pr legislative process um, that requires public comment. And I would like to see nonprofits spending their time, you know, make, making sure they're aware of the docket in their issue areas of what is in discussion and also maintaining and developing and investing in these relationships with neighborhoods so that when there is an opportunity, you already have that trust and you can kind of bring that support to the table before the cake gets baked, before the policy gets voted on, you are, you are ready and there with a, with a whole you know, uh, group of, of community folks who are like, this is our neighborhood and this is what we're looking for. Um, and, and I'd love to see, yeah, nonprofits, historically wet-led organizations really putting their money where their mouth is and, and being um, that kind of a connection, as opposed to saying, hey, this is what we do and take it or leave it which is just too often the kind of transactional nature of these relationships. I love this idea, Sean, of this, you know, this cycle of really authentic partnership development. And um, you, you mentioned philanthropy earlier and the role of philanthropists and, and philanthropy as being a predominantly white led and white owned field and sector. And that's certainly part of my background and, and what I have also observed. And someone actually asked a question here about why grants exclude the labor costs, mm -hmm. but are uh, developing expertise, but are perfectly willing to pay for stuff. And I think that really highlights that what you're talking about, right? So when there's funding opportunities, we're all, those are also operating in this same structural context of white supremacy. And so, <clears throat> you know, we, uh, at, having come from a large grant making organization, you know, you are frequently asking for many hours of free labor from low, you know, very low cost, sometimes very small organizations, just to even write the grant proposal, right? Like what you're asking for in those funding cycles is often asked for too rapidly without time to really thoroughly engage with partners in a meaningful way, even if you had those relationships already. You are often asked to do a lot of that free labor to develop the proposal and write it. It's many hours. Um, right. And then at the end, you're expected to, you know, you're really harshly evaluated on every little tiny thing. And so I have, I've been very encouraged by, uh, I think, some shifts I've seen in the philanthropic sector to try to focus on more um, development of authentic partnerships with implementing organizations and then just providing you know, basic funds, right? Like unrestricted money to just do your mission. Like we've done the due diligence. We know you're a good organization. Now we're just going to support you and amplify your work. And I think if, if we can kind of see, I would love to see more larger organizations and grant making organizations shift to a model like that, mm -hmm. where it's, it's less about these, this, incredibly vicious cycle of, ex it's very exploitative cycle of, of the way that funds are given and supported. And, um, and then if you do uh, get that grant, especially if it's a, if it's a okay. government grant, the grant administration alone, it will, will cause you to, to tear your hair out. <laughs> like it's a, yeah. so, I mean, the, the capacity to even engage, but, and that's what happens when you're so, you know, I, 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 do work with some philanthropic organizations and in my, you know, I was at the National Science Foundation. And so, you know, watching grant programs develop, it's just a free for all, right? You get these, you get a, a together. It's like, oh, we should ask them this and we should ask them this. And then it gets run through your general counsel. And they're like, no, 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 uh, this needs to be in the contract and th this isn't going to fly and da, 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 da. And so I understand how we've gotten there, but, you know, things like, like we should, 
figure out a way that there we never have to have a reimbursable grant ever again because a reimbursable grant is so inequitable. Um, I remember at one point there was a uh, a group that we were working with when I was at the Parks Foundation where this one individual uh, uh, woman who's just fantastic in, in South Park community was had, she was like, I need to get this money, this, this invoice paid because I have like maxed out a credit card. I'm like, you know, there's $10,000 in equipment and supplies that I put on this. And I didn't realize how long it was going to take for that to get turned around. And I don't know what I'm going to do. It's like 17% interest or whatever on it. And, you know, we just have to figure out, um, I understand why reimbursable grants have come around, you know, these bad actors that create and end up creating policies that, that, that put you there, but there are other ways <laughs> to, to, to figure out how to, to get ahead of that. But to your point about, you know, the, 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 the grant programs and, and the, the, um, um, the obligation of, of uh, grant, grant makers to think clearly about this. Um, you know, I, th I think that government and, uh, and, and academic grant making and, and philanthropic, all of them, like none of them should be uh, accepting any grant proposal where uh, it's, it's infeasible for them to do the kind of community engagement that they're talking about or implying that they're going to do, right? If if at the National Science Foundation, when we would look at at uh, a proposed project, we are really harshly evaluating the technical expertise and the capacity of those researchers to perform the experiments that they're talking about, like a feasibility, logistics, everything, right? And then we get to the kind of broader impacts criterion, the, the kind of paired now benefits to society side of the equation. And there's none of that kind of harsh evaluation. And I would look at some of these proposals and it's like, they're talking about going into co these communities and doing this research with community members. And you know, that we're, we're giving them plaudits for you know, lauding their, their, their investment in this community. It's like, look at the line item. <laughs> there's no way they're gonna be able to do that. And that certainly means that they're not paying for childcare or transportation or any sort of compensation for the for the community members who are going to their ostensibly participate in this out of the goodness of their hearts again this culture of self sacrifice until we are um, uh, rating these proposals on the feasibility of their community engagement why would you ever suck out part of your proposal to dedicate money to these communities and what i've started asking organizations to do is even if they don't put that in there or they expressly forbid the use of their funds for things like food or you know or, or things outside of the the this the, the bounds then say in your have it in your in your budget and say we will seek these funds elsewhere but we cannot do this work without these funds so that you're sending a message back to uh, to the grant makers to say what you're asking is ridiculous unless you are actually part of the solution. Yeah, if you're going to put your salary in the budget, then presumably your time is valuable, right. and therefore the time of the people you're going to interact with is valuable as well. And I, yeah, I, I could not agree more. I think there's a lot to be done there. And you know, I always say like, if you really want your dollars as a donor or as a philanthropist to benefit these communities, then give it to those communities, right? Develop the trust, like have the trust. And, and instead of trying to work through an intermediary that maybe feels a little bit better, maybe sit in a little bit of discomfort and just give directly to the people that you're actually trying to help. Um, and I'm seeing more, um, especially in philanthropy, them doing that. Um, and I'm seeing uh, governments, King County has uh, as, as developed this Healthy uh, Parks and Communities Fund. Um, and I was really grateful for them doing that. But man, that it was a 37 page application. <laughs> I mean, 37 question application. It was a much longer uh, in, in, in total in the end. Um, and it was a targeted equity grant for capacity building. And um, and they the, and I know the the organizers for, for this and the people who put this together and they had absolutely every best intention, but in the end this thing was a huge burden um, on on the folks who were applying, and um, and and I can't imagine for the folks who didn't receive the funding what a what a blow that must have been and how what a just net loss 
that entire endeavor was for them in terms of the staff hours. So that's another way that you know nonprofits can can start to see the needs in communities and answer those instead of their goals is is supporting grant making um, and grant writing with with uh, and building trust through that kind of work and working closely with communities and using your capacity to support their goals. Um, there's this other question in here about, uh, and hopefully I answered that other question from, from Ruth, because um, yeah, <laughs> that is a problem. Um, but uh, you know, the this painting a picture of what community stewardship looks like, the roles and activities and needs. Um, you know, so one of the things I'm hopeful, you know, one of the like kind of the vision that I see for uh, a project that, that the Community Land Conservancy um, could undertake is there's an opportunity to acquire a plot of land for future passive recreation. If it's a conservation area, it can have no more than 15% you know, impervious surface, but what's included in passive recreation is a huge, broad, wide ranging number of uses of you know, everything from farming to you know, walking trails to to lawns, it, it, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do there. Um, and so, it, you know, I, I see the opportunity to partner with affordable housing organizations like we're doing down in Skyway. And in that natural area, being able to say, acquire some of that property and hold it while then we work closely with the community and seek funding to develop uh, a local community stewardship organization or, um, uh, you know, uh, at, at a fiscally sponsored group, um, but something like there's the you know Duwamish Valley Youth Corps and the Little Brook Youth Corps. These um, as job training programs, kind of on the job training programs for green jobs, um, and where you're able to raise funds, public and private, to support uh, an organization that is doing the restoration and maintenance and stewardship work in. Um, the neighborhood, the local gr green space directly adjacent to the neighborhood where these folks are living, right? Creating that sense of place too, and pride uh, and, and, um, and uh, 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 you know, an oversight that comes along with that. Um, but then they're getting paid. So you have an economic development opportunity and uh, youth that go through these programs and are trained in this work those are transferable skills. Even if you don't go into green jobs, you have skills that you are able to transfer into whatever um, uh, jobs you, you, you know, whatever career you pursue after that. Um, but that community stewardship has so many knock-on benefits. Like I mentioned, King County or the uh, city, the city has 265, that's an under, 465. How many parks are there, Jessica, board chair? I uh, yeah, I don't have the answer. So. <laughs> I, I think it's over um, 500, actually. Okay, yes. So I knew it was up there, uh, and a huge percentage of the land space in in Seattle. There's no way to manage all of that land uh, out of out of one department. Um, but there are currently lots of union barriers and rules for who can actually do that work. So let's change those. Let's work with unions. Let's let's figure out how we can um, subsidize, support local stewardship and in partnership with those union jobs um, uh, and, and maintain, because currently it's not working. Like I, I mentioned the other day on uh, this interview on KUW, it's like I watched um, a, an agency come through, plant trees, move on. In the middle of August, they planted like six or seven birch trees in the middle of an open field, and then they disappeared checked off the box and I watched those trees die and there's no way I could reach them with a hose to, to, to water them. I just simply watched them die. So there is no connection between the installation of, of trees or whatever and the maintenance and follow-up and because these things are stretched. So let's have local neighborhoods and, and the oversight that comes with and the activation that comes with a neighborhood having their adjacent park area that they put their blood, sweat, and tears into um, improving and maintaining. Um, you can get no better kind of oversight and kind of you know neighborhood watch program than that. Yeah, and that's some, something else that we've heard in the parks parks board uh, is 
you know, an interest from community when we've gotten community feedback for strategic planning and whatnot in, in hiring mm -hmm. folks from the neighborhood to participate in, you know, for those jobs in the yeah. neighborhood, in that ownership. And it's 489 parks, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But what's the percentage land cover? <laughs> I'm just kidding. You don't have to worry about it. But it's a lot. It's like 11 to something percent. That's, yeah, significant. Yeah. So I want to kind of, you know, as I've been listening, right, and I listen to all the kind of, you, you bring like all these amazing solutions, right, that, that I think are very tangible, very action-based, like, and I love that you're able to kind of, you know, show um, the, the ways in which we can kind of build some of these authentic um, partnerships and really start to develop um, more of a kind of be involved in these communities, but to like put on my kind of you know, public garden kind of hat and what does this have to do with public gardens, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think that this is something that I, I um, that I really do truly believe that I think in, in so many ways that we are really sometimes hesitant, not, we're not stepping into this kind of space um, in either advocacy or true community partnership um, towards kind of, you know, betterment, because this is one of the things I think we talked about in our preparation, right, was really talking about the, the utility of gardens in this sense, right? We're really like great at the fact that, yes, we offer education. We have partnerships with many schools, parks, municipalities. We have knowledge. Um, this is kind of part of the education, but it's also like, how do we become, right? Like, really functioning parts of this kind of community when it comes to these kind of strategies. And so I kind of feel like there's such an opportunity um, there, right? Because then at the same time, we also have that kind of conservation uh, mindset. Most people don't understand or know that, you know, we're doing a lot of research. Uh, we're working with, um, I think, different types of other nonprofits and organizations. Um, and yet, for many public gardens who are located in certain um, cities and whatnot, we are also part of economic development. You know, why would people move to a certain city and want to stay there? We come become part of this like entertainment space, but yet there's still this other level of utility that I don't know that we're tapping tapping into, which mm -hmm. is with some of these local communities and how they interact with those spaces and then offering our spaces up for, for some of that, right? And, and I guess mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say is, um, I think we have a great opportunity to become more facilitative mm -hmm. in different levels. And I don't know, like, and, and Christina, I don't know what, you know, some of your thoughts are, and I'm, I'm just getting to know, you know, this, um, the, the relationship that UW Botanic Gardens and the Arboretum has, you know, with the city and everything else. But that, that is sometimes the something I think about, right? Because public gardens are so dynamic and we do cut across almost every side of a community and society in so many different ways. We're like nine businesses in one, yet I don't know that we sometimes really think about that. Mm. Yeah. Christina, if you yeah. Are, yeah, I mean, I think I think you see that in sort of, you know, the broad mission statements of many public gardens, right, because you are trying to do a lot of different things. And certainly at UW Botanic Gardens, you know, we're doing research on conservation, we're doing, you know, education of everyone from preschoolers through adults, um, you know, we're doing you know, preservation in the herbarium and, and all kinds of different things. We have a library on site. There, there's so many different facets to what we do. And you're, it's a constant juggling act. And I think there is extreme, you know, there's extraordinary value in all of those things and really trying to look and honor those, the, that value. And at the same time, I think adjust our approach to those things so that we are opening the doors to a you know wider audience and that will I mean I see it as like it's a pathway to help us do better even right to serve our missions more to to serve to actually be successful in the ways we want to be successful if we would say we want to serve the public well who are we, are we really talking about here what does the public look like right and so you know I think there are these many diverse um, values and, and contributions that we have to make. 
And the question is, are we, are we achieving and making those contributions at the levels that we could be? And what can we do now to really, really meet the moment and do and achieve what we want to achieve? So I, I, uh, you've all heard this, me say this before, I think, well, maybe not Maylin, but um, my favorite quote from a, a group that the Nature Conservancy hired to, to look at the climate change, uh, uh, you know, campaigns for climate change, you know, and one of the, the quotes from them, I can't remember who they were, but was most people don't care about most things most of the time. And that's like, it's just super important to remember that. Like most people don't have the time. Most people don't have the ex experience in any one area to 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 care enough or to to have grown to love something. Most people don't care about most things most of the time. And if you start from that position and evaluate what it is you do and what it is you offer, then it helps. It's very clarifying, right? Um, uh, and I think it's your job to figure out what do they care about and fit your agenda to that. And so. What what is it that they care about? That's why I was saying, like, when you show up before the agenda, it's like, don't just be like cluing in on like, oh, that's something that that we do or we're interested in. Listen to all of the things that are going on, so you get a sense of like, whoa, these are the issues that are bubbling up as top priorities in this this community. And is there anything that I have expertise in that can help them um, achieve those goals? And so, I mean. I ask this about parks, but like, you know, often, but I do it uh, in, uh, you know, I've got a dream about gardens too, but like, it's, I always say like, what is a park? You know, what is a park to you? Um, you know, what is a garden? Um, because the, that is a very mutable plastic term. Um, and it means a very different thing to some people. And it's some, it's interesting. So I'm part of this nature and health working group and we're talking about the health benefits of nature and stuff, but so often the conversation starts at a presupposition that what we're talking about when we refer to a park as a green passive use, copses of trees and some natural landscaping, da 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 da, and we're talking about the health benefits of that. And there's this presumption that that's what we're doing. It's like people walking around in a forested area or something, right? But when we're talking about the benefits of, of, of health and nature and open access, and we are not considering that what m might be most healthful for a community is a basketball court or a hockey rink or something or, you know, uh, out there, which is definitely not what these folks are thinking when we start a conversation, then um, if, we, if we don't even entertain that, then we've just cut off our nose to spider face in the first, in, in, in trying to be relevant <laughs> because you're just assuming. And once you start there, you're never gonna bring people um, to, to that conversation if you haven't already started to look at the whole span. And so, you know, I mean, I feel like um, public gardens should do a deep evaluation of that. I mean, that could be a really interesting um, set of surveys in different communities and ethnicities as like, what is a garden? You know, just that simple question, getting some, some feedback on like, what, what do you think of when you think of a garden? Um, and having at some point uh, uh, gar public gardens that feature different uh, de gardens in different uh, cultures and ethnicities and serve different uh, and doing research that is relevant to, you know, I mean, I don't know about you. I tried. Uh, there's certain things that I grew uh, grew growing up in in Southeast that I can't grow here now. And I've tried different methods, and I've gotten success by adjusting certain things and stopping watering for this and and cold frames and this and that. And so I do that kind of uh, uh, you know anecdotal research myself. But do that kind of thing with some important crop to a certain community. I have a dream, and if anybody in the audience ends up doing this you have to get me involved because I've been thinking about this for decades, literally decades. But, you know, Somali community and lots of uh, Muslim communities, um, you know, uh, have goats uh, and, and, and either in their food or ritually. Um, and man, I want to just have a Somali run and operated business that takes the goats around to do the kind of weed work of, of you know, <laughs> eating, cleaning, cleaning up stuff. And then um, also has those goats 
for for uh, the livestock trade. There are probably all sorts of reasons why that can't happen, but it is a dream of mine to close that loop between <laughs> having goats doing restoration work and um, and serving a smaller community. So um, there, we just haven't spent enough, or really, if we're being honest, like almost any time thinking about different conceptions of of the term garden. Um, and I think that's a good place to start. And what a public garden could be then having um, master gardeners from Somali community <laughs> or uh, from the Southeast um, and coming in and saying, this, this, is, this is what I grew growing up. And this is crucial to my, my, um, my you know, my, in my kitchen garden, this is, this is what I have. And, and I've, I've tried growing jalapenos here and they just don't get hot because it's not hot enough. You know, those kinds of conversations become relevant. They don't necessarily become relevant when you're focused simply on the on an English garden as contrasted with French garden. And they might be in addition to, but not solely. I love so much about what you just said, Sean. <laughs> and you said something earlier in your talk too that I think really touched on this. And it, there's this, you know, the phrase like nothing about us without us, right? <laughs> And so I, I, I love this. And, and one of the things that we've, we're trying to do, and Jessica is part of this effort, is to actually ask those questions, right? To say, you know, we as a public green space, we can, we can execute on our mission based on an assumption about what people want and need. But if we never ask them, then are we doing it for them or are we doing it for us? And I think there's very often, especially in philanthropic endeavors and nonprofit endeavors where the intention is so good, right? People really wanna do good for others, but there's an element of that that is not really engaging them in a way that, um, that is authentic as you spoke about. And so then you have to wonder, are you doing this work to make you feel better and feel good about who you are and your purpose in this world? Or are you really doing it to serve those people? Because what their needs might be may not be what you think they are. And so we're, we're actually getting ready to do a survey. We've got some, some funds to do that uh, through the Arboretum Foundation, the state legislature to, to actually ask those questions. You know, What is it that you need and want from your, these spaces? And I'm really excited by what I think we're gonna learn. Wow, that's great. Yeah, because that's where it starts. I mean. And the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And it's, and too often it's easy to be like, oh, this is totally what they need. And I have seen that happen so many times where something is built and the community is like, we didn't ask for this. Yeah. And you're using our time to help you feel better. <laughs> and thank you uh, for your efforts. But I would love if you put that effort towards this over here that we actually need. Um, and unless you are able to make that connection between what it is you can offer and what they actually need, then, then why would you expect them to be uh, in, engaged? You wouldn't be engaged in something that was offered that way, um, especially when you have multiple competing priorities. And yeah. that is, is the reason for the capacity because there is in a, and we, we also need to, to treat community engagement uh, expertise as the expertise it is and compensate it justly. So that's the other piece is this needs to be seen as an equivalent skill set to, to your, my PhD in ecology is the ability to, uh, and the, um, and all of, you know, the decades of, of your training in, in being the neighborhood on the, uh, you know, being the, the neighbor on the block that knows everyone by name and, and can call people out and be like, we're doing this now. That is equivalent or maybe exceeds <laughs> the utility of a PhD. <laughs> Let me tell you in the real in real terms. All right, so I'm gonna have to jump in and play timekeeper here because we're oh, a little bit over. Yeah. Um, I appreciate you bringing up this last slide, Sean, and wanna give you a minute if you wanna do any talk, speaking on that and also give everybody an opportunity for some closing remarks. But let's start with the, the slide. Oh yeah, this I just pulled up because it was it was kind of what Christina was was getting at too. It's like, you know, don't tell the community, ask them. Don't shoehorn the community needs into your mission. Other way around, um, don't speak for them. Lift them up. This like kind of you know bringing, uh, you know, on behalf of the community, switching that from on behalf to bringing the table to them and not bringing them to the table. <laughs> um, yeah. Do build long term relationships. 
um, use your mission to support their goals, and then everyone wins. Uh, and um, that community capacity piece without, um, without running the show, that fine line between, um, between like, oh, this is capacity building is like, you know, I, I always say constantly through a project and you should do this in your work is constantly asking yourself, is this community better off um, uh, after I leave or if I never came? Will, do they have more expertise, job training, funding, um, uh, you know, more of some outcome that they sought? Um, and is that better off? Are they better off in those respects than, um, you know, uh, if I had just never, never come? Um, and so that critical question, I think, Lee, well, helps people decide, like, on a lot of these questions, these recommendations here, right? Yep. All right. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Any other closing remarks from, from Maylin or Christina? So thank okay. you, Sean. Yep. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank this you so much. Um, appreciate the audience sticking around with us for an extra 10 minutes. Um, it was a great conversation. Um, really appreciate all of you. And we hope to see many of you tomorrow at morning um, and continue these conversations. Um, look forward to hearing what ideas everybody has. So. Yeah, I'm sorry I can't make it, but have yeah. a great time. I'm super excited um, yeah. to hear, hear more. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night.